Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, so what I have a couple things I have in mind to talk about, but I'm open to making this an open discussion if you have things that you're particularly interested in or not interested in. I myself just tried to think of what you might want from this kind of session um, and what I've been thinking about in terms of metacognition. Um, metacognition means thinking about thinking, thinking about cognition, but it really breaks into a couple parts depending on which researchers you talk to, many parts, but at least two. It includes our knowledge of thinking and learning in general. So anything we know about strategies for learning, the ways of uh, picking up information and storing it. But it also includes our sense of ourselves as learners. So how we direct our attention, how we ourselves learn and remember things better in some cases than others and so forth. It's important to keep those two things distinct because sometimes we're talking about one kind of knowledge, strategies, different ideas for what you can do in different scenarios, and other times we're really talking about self-awareness. Um, both of these are considered reasonably part of metacognition, but sort of two different sides, two different parts to it. The, everybody agrees metacognition is a good thing, but the problem is when you don't have it, you don't realize you don't have it. So that's the fundamental issue in this area. And I think I want to present just a tiny amount of data. And those of you who are at the intercession uh, talk saw this as well. It's, it, I, I call this the incompetence effect. Dunning and Kruger call it the Dunning Kruger effect. That's just something <laughs> you name stuff. I like the incompetence effect or even the novice effect better, though, um, because it describes what it is. So this is a simple study. It's been replicated a bunch of different times. Students were asked right after they take an exam to estimate how they did on the exam. And they were asked two questions, both what do you think your test performance was and what do you think is your mastery of the material. So what you can see here along the x-axis is this is actual performance on that test then. So we've got it split into quartiles, the people who did the worst on the left, the people who did the right, the top 25% on the right. So what you can see here I have mapped out are just perceived mastery and perceived test performance. First, they think the test is pretty good. <laughs> it's going to actually measure their mastery. And the people who are in the bottom quarter do actually think they're going to do worse than the people in the top quarter. Uh, those middle two quartiles are about the same. Those were uh, indistinguishable and not much different, but a little different from the bottom. So it did lay out kind of the way you would expect. The people at the top of the class thought they were going to do best. The people who are, in fact, going to score the worst thought they were going to do the worst. What's interesting is when you then map out actual performance, the people in the top two quartiles were pretty close. They were fairly accurate. The very people at the very top underestimated their performance a little, and the people in the, uh, between the uh, 50th and the 75th uh, percentile un uh, slightly over, did I say underestimated? Overestimated their performance. So they thought they were going to do slightly better than they did. <laughs> but the people in the bottom two quartiles are really in trouble. They really thought they were going to do a lot better than they did. In the case of the people in the bottom quartile, they thought they'd score around a 55 on the exam. They got a 10 on average. So the problem is that when, so you could call this the incompetence effect. This is what Dunning and Kruger call it. Their point was when you don't have knowledge, you don't know how much knowledge you don't have, you frequently make mistakes like this. You overestimate how well you're going to do now when you're tested on the knowledge because you think you have more of it than you have. And so they replicated, this has been replicated both in their lab and other labs across, with college students across a bunch of different areas. It's not just psychologists. That was an intro psych study. Uh, it's not just psychologists who think this. Um, it almost doesn't matter what task you give people. If they're new to an area, they inflate their sense of how well they're doing. And the more they get expert in an area, the less inflation they do until you get to the very top. And then they tend to underestimate slightly how well they're going to do. It's also true outside of academia if you just look at people's knowledge in the real world. When they're novices, they overestimate how much they know. Once they're experts, they have an accurate or much more accurate sense of what they know. And I just found this one. I hope this has been replicated. I got to go look, but I didn't check yet. When they asked college professors whether they were below average or above average teachers, 94% of us thought we were above average. Really not possible. So, it happens all the time. Maybe better than the incompetence effect, we should call it the novice effect. And I think it's one of the things we deal with as teachers is that we're often talking to people who are making really bad estimates, or really bad assessments of what they know themselves. 
So what I want to argue, what I've been thinking is that you can use metacognitive knowledge and awareness. We can use it ourselves as teachers to assess what's going wrong in our classes and how to fix it. And when we do incorporate metacognition into our classes, it helps students as well because it's the kind of knowledge that helps them. This is now, it's going to be on both levels, both strategies and self-awareness, but it's the kind of knowledge that students can really transfer to other learning situations and allows them to take information from your class and apply it better. And since those are things we tend to value, the idea is metacognition adds a lot of this stuff. I would argue it adds a lot for you too to take this approach to solving problems in your class. My main two suggestions today, I tried to pare it down to just a couple of things, are to figure out what you mean to teach and then only teach and assess that. So this is a time-saving issue, I think, or an aggravation-saving issue. One of the problems I think I have in classes is that I try to do too much. And then I'm frustrated when I can't do all the different things. One of the things I've been thinking about is trying to just do the things I care about, which is hard enough, and just focusing on those things and letting all this other stuff go. So I'll try to give some examples of that. So that would sort of be a self-awareness, this is a self-awareness and strategy sort of thing. The other thing I think I would suggest is that when you have an idea of what would be a good way for a student to do it, go ahead and require students to do it the good way. Um, this involves metacognition as well, because I think how you find out what you want to teach students is by reflecting yourself on how a professional would do the tasks that you set out. And so given that you are the professionals and know the steps, one idea is to try to build those in for the students. Now they learn both the process of doing something as well as some of them by chance will produce the right product anyway. But if you force all of them to go through the steps of the process, they'll learn more about it. So I, both of these are about sort of working metacognition into your teaching, but in, in maybe two different ways. When I say metacognition, I'm thinking about it broken down. Ambrose set this up this way, uh, so I'll give him credit here. He calls it self-directed learning, but same difference. The idea is to do a task, you have to assess the demands of the task, evaluate your own knowledge and skills, plan an approach, monitor, that gets to be the self-awareness part, that's part of the self-awareness part, and then adjust as needed. So that's his way of breaking down sort of the meta, any, any, the being metacognitive about any task involves those different steps. If you look at this as where students could have hang-ups, they could have hang-ups at any one of these points, depending on the task that you give them. So when I think about my own teaching frustrations, you don't necessarily share these, but I think things like, well, why don't they read the assignment? Why don't they plan ahead? I told them there was a big project. It's obviously going to take time. Um, why don't they learn from the mistakes that they make? Why don't they do that deep learning that I'm hoping for rather than just trying to memorize stuff by rote? Um, and I find myself trying to ask myself these questions. Do they have to read the assignment? They don't read the textbook. Why does that annoy me if they don't have to read the textbook to get through my course? So I've started to think about how I can build in, again, only the things I care about. It turns out I don't care about all of these things. But the things that I care about try to build them into the course. So as a quick example, I'm going to give you a couple longer examples. But as a quick example, um, with any task that you set out to use in your class, I guess I'm thinking of assignments and things like that, you should think about what's the goal of the task. That probably sounds obvious. But thinking really, what's the goal for you of the task? We all assign papers and we all assign homeworks, but what's the point for you of the paper? I've been thinking a lot about writing because I'm grading writing constantly lately. Um, and I sometimes struggle with, there's an enormous number of things, especially for a not good writer, to pay attention to in a paper, especially when I say write a professional paper like a, like a psychologist would. Um, there's an enormous number of things, a bewildering for them number of things to pay attention to. I know that. This is the problem with being an expert, is you frequently underestimate how much of this stuff there is. Once you start looking at it, and of course we are aware of how students do it wrong, there's an enormous number of things to pay attention to. Not all of them are equally important. Or I should say, not all of them are equally important to me as a teacher of psychology writing. A lot of them are when I'm teaching writing in psychology, and then when I'm teaching content in psychology, I'm teaching a child development course, I care about even fewer of these things. I, when I look at my own aggravation with grading, my problem is I try to do way too much. I try to help them with their grammar and the organization and the style and the content and making a point and trying to format it correctly. And it's too much, too much for the students, too much for me. 
what has helped me pare that down has been to try to think about what's the point of any particular assignment. Maybe I can take some of these things out of some of the assignments because I just don't care. Others of them, maybe I want to build them in as assignments instead of assuming that students will have some sense of what's the difference between formatting and content. Maybe I should spend some time on formatting and having format stuff. And then I should spend some other time on content and say, I'm really going to care about content. I'm not going to care anymore about grammar. Write it however you want it, but get a good point down on paper. And so thinking care carefully about what you want from any particular task. We use a lot of these assignments just because they're there. We don't get everything we want out of them, one suggestion would be to try to limit what you want from it. I guess that's a general suggestion about any task, but I've been thinking about it in terms of writing. Let me pause there. Questions? Thoughts? Not yet. <laughs> the flip side to that bottom point, if it's important, make it part of the process, is if it's not important, just leave it out. I mean, it is acceptable to not grade the grammar and not grade the citations or the format <laughs> content, I got to say, maybe, OK? But actually, I had my students do a formatting task where I said, I don't care about the content. Just make it look right. I don't care what's in it. Later, you'll think of a really great title. Just put it on the page now. I just want it formatted correctly. So you might not even care about content in some cases. OK, well, I'll go on yammering away, but break in. So thinking about any, any task we have to approach as involving these components, I want to give a couple suggestions for how you can, I'm going to call it embedding metacognition into the course, make it part of the requirements of the course so that your students get something from it and hopefully sort of move forward. The first thing I want to suggest um, is uh, uh, addresses the last two parts of this. They're not a necessarily... I guess they're sort of in order, but then they cycle. Uh, but these last two parts, how do students monitor their own progress, reflect on their own progress, reflect on how they're learning, and then adjust their strategies if it turns out that they're not doing well. The thing I've been using for the last couple of years is called an exam wrapper. Um, it's a funny name. I gave you an example of it. Um, the, idea behind the exam wrapper is after students take an exam, ideally something like a midterm where they're going to take another exam later and there's some value to them immediately on reflecting on it. You require them to reflect on how they did. So require them to go through the exam in a painstaking way and report for you sort of two things. It's in two parts. How did you prepare for the exam? And then how did you do on the exam? And specifically, I wrote these. This is adapted from uh, I forget where I adapted it from. I should really have the reference on there. Um, I adapted it. These are based on my specific exam and the mistakes that people made. So I went through the exams to make this the first time and tried to see where people lost points. You'll notice that you got to get all the way down to F, lack of understanding of the concept, before I have something important about why people miss points. Honest to God, most people miss points on my exams because they're not reading carefully or they make silly mistakes or they mistake one thing for another or they fill in a part of the question. And so, so, I, so I identified those based on the exam, but it was the uh, same idea. You could write this for any exam. Uh, you could look at how people lost points. The, so the idea is to ask students to, now that they've taken the exam, sort of like in that study, how'd you do? Ask them to reflect on what happened. Um, I find it, the, the, it has, I, I would say it has a couple of pieces of value. I found it valuable to get these back, because at first it was interesting to see how students were preparing for the exam. How many of them read the textbook for the first time just before the midterm? Um, how many of them didn't do any of this stuff? Some of them glanced over the slides. And if you ask them to uh, um, how much time, it was 15 minutes for the midterm. So it's interesting to have that written down. And I do say clearly to them, although I'm telling you in this voice, I say to them, I don't care what you write. Write the truth. Because I'm not going to grade you on what you write. I'm just going to hand it back to you. The truth is, of course, I read it and went, oh my god, 15 minutes. Um, but obviously, that student was calculating that 15 minutes was enough to prep for a midterm. That was fine. So. Um, so that was, yeah, gave me some information. It was also interesting to see how students lost points on the exam. The first time I created this, I went through the exam and figured out where everybody lost points so I could make the categories. But now that I have them and I teach the same class, I use the same categories, it is kind of interesting. 
Um, that's the part that I think the students find interesting. They could care less about how they prepare. I go, oh, you bombed the exam. You studied 15 minutes. What do you think you should do next time? And they go, I think I should spend a little more time studying. And like, that one's not a real great insight to them. They kind of knew that before they spent 15 minutes studying. So having it written down, maybe there's a value, maybe not. Some say psychological value of admitting what you've done wrong, writing it down on paper. I think the part that's really informative to them, actually really useful, the feedback I've gotten from students is that second part where they're actually forced to look and see where they lost points on the exam. So many of them are sort of stupid. They're stupid mistakes. They're mistakes where they go, I knew this stuff. I go, yeah, I noticed. Because you just read the questions wrong all the time, or you filled in an answer that wasn't there, or you flip-flopped words, or you had the right concept and it was the wrong term. You know, maybe something pseudo-conceptual problem. Um, those are the things that I think students are sometimes realizing, this is why I'm bad at exams. I bet I do this all the time. I bet I read too fast. I don't go back and check the ones that I wasn't sure about. Um, I will say that I, I, when I give exams and I do this exam wrapper, I go, the whole point of this is for you to try to gain some insight into how you do these things. You have to take exams perpetually. If you constantly do this stuff badly, you'll just do badly. It won't reflect how you actually understand stuff. Um, the, the, the second thing that happens is students go, so what should I do now? I go, oh, tough one. So I actually find this helps as well to sort of break down what has gone wrong. This is what I used to do when the occasional student would come to me and say, I studied and I bombed the exam. I don't get it. Because I always say, that's the problematic person, right? If you think you were going to do well, and you, if you thought you were going to get a 55 and you got a 10, you better come see me. Um, and this is the kind of thing we would go through. How did you miss that? What was wrong? You thought you knew this stuff. One possibility is they really don't know it. But often they have bad skills. They're not good at this stuff. They're not good at taking an exam. They get all confused when it's so many multiple choice questions. Um, and they forget to do things like go back and check. What I point out to them is a little bit of self-awareness goes a long way. If you know you're going to do it wrong, now you become like those students up at the B and C level where maybe they're overestimating a little. Now they get their grade back. They go, oh, I did worse than I thought I was going to do. It may well re-motivate them. Um, if you can get close to your approximate, if you can assess yourself well and get close, that's usually a really positive, it's positive feedback for students in general. Um, if they can't get close, I find you're dealing with some number of students who go, I don't know what's going on. I study and study and study. I write cue cards constantly. I don't know why I'm not doing well on the exam. Um, so I found it a value to me. It doesn't cost much. I send it home as a homework. I hand it back to them before the final. I really, other than look at it myself for interest, I don't do much with it. It's meant to be for them. Yeah. I send it back with the graded test. So I give them the test back. I go, take it home and reflect on it. I'm answering questions next time after you've looked through everything, not now while you're mad about your grade. <laughs> uh, but I go, no, yeah. yeah. You could. You could. You could ask them. possible yeah that's right yeah you absolutely could you absolutely could I haven't looked at whether those are particularly reliable data uh, at that point after the exam because yeah it's probably a week later other thoughts Uh -huh. Like have them predict, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, do you mean predicted or oh, you mean actual? Yeah. <laughs> Again, like if there's a value to just honestly. What is self-reflection, right? We're asking students who, I understand too, for the students, it's painful to self-reflect, especially when you've done poorly. Those people getting A's are a little more motivated. The people who got a 10 are like, oh, they don't want to look at it. But yeah, so, so I think those probably are smart things to build in. I mean, I think anything you do, I think the, the tendency for a lot of students, or I should say for those bad, incompetent, novice students, is they get a bad grade, they go, oh, and they put it away. That's it, they don't want to think about it anymore. And it 
doesn't help them and it's no value to them, all you've done is assess them as bad people. <laughs> That's really not the value of an exam. Um, so part of this too is trying to change their mindset. I mean, I think if you go, <laughs> let's just, let's think about that number and where it came from. Could have been 100, why wasn't it? I think it could have a value, yeah. Yeah. Um, mostly people wrote nothing, it's on me. <laughs> I was like, God! <laughs> That's right! It is on you! Um, I have had people say, you know, I'd like some extra time. This, I, I'll say, I, Dad, this is not actually true. I, so I've been doing, I've been teaching a similar class research methods for years now. We changed it slightly. I've, and I've been using this now for two, I've used it for three semesters. I got very consistent midterm grades in that class. I. I write a similar midterm every year and everybody did the same. This year they bombed it. They, did, they scored 70%. I've gotten 82%, 80, 81, 82% for the last 10 years. Now they got a 72 on the exam. And so I put another one saying, are you interested in joining a success group for this class? Because I had scores as low as 50, 45 on the exam. Never seen that before. So. Um, Mostly they don't. Mostly they don't ask for anything. But um, I'm offering, I guess, for this class. I'm well, like, holy crap! They can't fail this class. They're going to have to try to catch up. So I'm going to see if I'll they'll work with them. And uh, people wrote yes. <laughs> they were. Uh, I think most of my F students and D students wrote yeah. They would. They would. They would come in for something. I didn't know what to call it. They're like, what's a success group? I'm like, I know. The the literature says you shouldn't call it remedial in any way because as soon as you call it remedial people start flunking out but I didn't know what to call it and they were like success group that's a stupid name for it so I don't know what to call it um, but yeah right I do think I mean this is the problem once you start talking to students about this they go hey I never thought about this before what should I do then and you go great okay let's think about all the ways in which people learn but you probably do have strategies for a lot of these students, especially because I think the mostly the ones who come to you are the DNF students. It's not the A students who are worried about this. And the A students, honestly, they go, I lost two points because I did something stupid. Who cares? Um, it's not really for them. They probably already do this, or they don't need to yet. I still think the exercise is fine. My feeling is you explain a task, even the people who are already good at it can practice. Um, so it's not going to hurt them. But the people it really helps so are the people who get some insight from it. They didn't they don't do this naturally um, or they don't do it in cases when it's hard to do and so forcing them to do it is sort of putting sort of trying to get them to step in the right direction just to make it self-reflective I found it self-reflective to do it too sorry did you have a question okay, so. other thoughts okay let's solve one more problem um, so if we think of the problem uh, being teaching, we go through the same process to set up a course, to set up the assignments for a course, or to think about solving a problem in a course. Um, I'm now talking about us asking these questions of ourselves. We assess the demands of the task. We might ask what we ourselves know already. I find it interesting to ask what the students know already. That seems to have a pretty big influence on what I think a, the goal of a task should be and what I think they can accomplish. So for example, when I first arrived at RIT, I had a, a severe overestimate of what students already knew and could accomplish over the course of then 10 weeks uh, at a quarter and now 15 weeks. Um, I've adjusted a lot. Uh, a lot of the adjustment I've made in my own teaching has been thinking, you know what, they don't get all of it anyway. So why don't I focus on the stuff I care about and do a lot more of that and not worry about getting so much content in. Um, thinking about what they know and how far you can get them, I think, is, has a value when you're determining goals. Um, evaluating our own knowledge and skills, again, I, we're all professionals at doing this, but we, I find it useful to think about what problems I'm expecting. Having taught here now for nine years, uh, I already know what the writing is like. I know what's going to go wrong with the team projects. I know what's hard about some students taking multiple choice tests or writing essays and so forth. Um, so having, spending some time reflecting on the problems you habitually have and which ones of those you want to solve. I would say too, it's not that the, all of them get solved, it's that you should decide to solve some of them and just uh, toss the rest of them. Not care about them anymore because that removes the aggravation as well. 
Um, and then plan the approach. Start thinking about what strategies you have, where you can get feedback. I find I end up thinking a lot, when I think about how to improve my classes, I think about trying to build in different motivations for students because they do come at these tasks for different reasons. My excitement about learning methodology and psychology doesn't necessarily transfer to everybody automatically. And so I find that if I give them different reasons for having to learn certain things or for gaining certain skills, that's a value. I'll bring that up in a minute. Um, always smart for us to spend some time reflecting on what works and what doesn't work, but I don't find myself doing that except for fleeting moments right after the lecture bombed or the assignment was terrible or the students got 10 points lower on the exam. I, don't, I, I think it's a smart idea and I don't do enough of it. I don't know how it gets built into a course. It would kind of be nice if there was some time when we were meant to do a little reflection and get a little feedback and make a little progress. Um, and then adjust the strategies. I would say the, the motivation for me to do this is to try to make the courses better. I don't like being frustrated by the same kinds of things. I don't like seeing students struggle. And as I offer to help them, I see the same kinds of things coming up repeatedly. So I think I can build it in the class and stop answering questions in office hours now and answer them for the people who don't come ask them as well. So the problem I thought I would, the other problem I thought I would solve for you, <laughs> solve, is team projects. Um, this is something that Rick and I have been talking about. And I'm going to rely heavily on her. The website is fantastic. So as soon as you like any of the, these ideas, you should go to the website and start downloading stuff off of it. Um, there's some great things there. Uh, the, so I assign team projects. Do you guys all assign group projects? Some people don't. OK, well, maybe this is not a big deal then. But when uh, I find. I hate them, uh, like students for the most part. Um, and I've now I've gone from doing probably what was a typical team project, assign it, get a bunch of people in a group, say go, <laughs> let's collect the end product at the end. And half of the time it was a problem, and a couple times it was a serious disaster. And um, and I didn't think as deeply about them as I could have. I thought they had value. My line for students is, life is a group project. You are forever being assigned to other people who don't pull their weight, don't do their job, don't meet the deadlines, and you have to figure out what to do. So this is part of your training. But that's not a great reason for going through an awful experience. Um, what this is actually from, this is from the TLS website. This is a good point. Group projects involve so much more than just the skills involved in individual projects. So if you stop right there, I already know when I hand out this project of doing an experiment in my methodology class that some of the students can't do that task. They're not actually individually, they don't have the skills yet to do that task very well. And now I'm loading on all these other tasks. They have to work with other people. They got to figure out what responsibilities are and share them. They got to figure out how to manage not just their own time, but time as a group. They have to meet deadlines because they're working as a group. They can't all rely on doing it at the last minute. They got to communicate effectively or at all, which has been a trick uh, in some classes. And they have to resolve disagreements and conflicts. I have to say, when I looked at that group, I was like, oh my god, life is a group project. We have these problems in the peer groups I have. Among faculty, we have some of these problems sometimes. Of course, students are going to have these same problems as well. So. Um, when we think about, if we use now this breakdown of metacognition to think about planning a team project in a course, we should think about first, what's the goal of having them do a team project at all? Given that it's almost impossible for them to do well, no, it's difficult for them to do well, what would be the goal of having them do it in the first place? Um, but then also thinking about what are the steps of the task? Again, the steps that you care about. There's a million potential steps to make it a really fantastic thing. It's not going to be a really fantastic thing over 15 weeks. And so you ought to think about what steps you care about, what outcome you care about. Um, Thinking about how to create good teams is a tricky one. I'm not even going to talk about it. I have no idea. I really don't know how to do it. There are some ideas out there floating around that groups shouldn't get too large. Three to five is a good number. The professor should always choose them. The students like to, but then they admit that those were the worst groups they were ever in, were the ones they chose themselves. But they hate it when you do it. I don't have a solution for that. I'll just say I think it's a problem. It's hard. Um, figuring out that the students then having to figure out what their own roles are is difficult. You may have a better sense as a professional at least what the roles should be. That might be something to give them. Uh, so breaking the task into steps, certainly planning the approach to the task you have a better sense of than students do. And you might think about which of those things are really critical such that you could build them into the task and make them requirements.
Um, obviously, it's important for teams to monitor their progress and have time to reflect. That also typically not built in, and just the same way I don't build it into my own teaching and classes, I don't require students typically to build it into a team project, but it would be smart too. And then thinking about having, having monitored their progress or reflected, how do they make adjustments and, or resolve disagreements or resolve the problems that we expect to happen. Uh, to happen. What I'm going to suggest is on the flip side of the handout I gave you is to try using assessments to keep up with these kinds of things. I found these assessments useful, but I also have to refer to, I'm pointing to the TV screen it's on, the, uh, on the website TLS you have a peer eval form, which is awesome. It's an online form that students can go in and click through and you can have <laughs> a lot to be said for data that you just go look at. It's already on the computer as opposed to irritating pieces of paper that you're GA, if you're lucky enough to have one, has to add up all the numbers. But even so, mostly these are for students to use themselves and for teams to use themselves as a way to get a conversation going. It's also information, uh, useful information, I would say, for the professor. So the, these different assessments, the top one is a team assessment. And the idea is each person in the team would do the same one, and then they would discuss what was going on in the team. The second one is, a, is an individual assessment of other members of the team. Um, and that's a much more extensive one, and I clipped it back a little bit. Both of these were from the University of Minnesota. It has a cute, I'll just show it to you, a cute website called, uh, oh, here, first. Let me show you our own teaching and learning services website. This is the small group one. It's got just a fantastic amount of content here, um, and it has the links to the peer evaluation uh, uh, thingamajabi. Is that what you call it? Yeah. <laughs> the thingamajabi, yeah. Uh, this is the University of Minnesota site. This also has a ton of stuff. That's where I got these assessments. They have downloadable ones. The, the individual assessment's much, much longer than the one I showed you. It's called Surviving the Zombie Apocalypse. No, group projects. Um, uh, it's also, I've, I found it really useful um, and helpful. I'm big on stuff. I like to walk away with deliverables. <laughs> so I'm handing you things. I'm sending you things. Feel free to ask me for more stuff. I have more stuff if you want it. Um, uh, I'm not sure that all of these would be useful for you, but I've but I like the idea of these. I always use some kind of peer some kind of peer assessment when teams are going on, uh, but I actually thought this was a better one. And again, as I glance through the list, I go, oh, I'm going to do this at faculty meeting next time. <laughs> Watch out, we're going to fill this out about the rest of our team members and see how we're all doing. One value of this is to just give a check-in, right? Force them to reflect. You go, there's no time for reflection. Let me give you a moment to reflect and ask them to do this so that they do spend some time reflecting. The, the other is that it can identify the it can identify the outlier in the group who things feels like things are not going well and is willing to say things are not going well. This is an assessment, of course. And I saw mixed messages about should it be anonymous, should it not be anonymous, should you assess yourself or only your other team members. There's a lot of mixed stuff about that. I would decide on one and then when it goes badly, do the other one next time. Um, but in terms of the team stuff, I, you know, you're looking for people who say, yeah, we disagree respectfully. Everybody goes, yeah, yeah, we do that fine. And one person goes, uh-uh, we don't disagree respectfully. And then th that, should be, that should be a focus of discussion. It's a way for people to give feedback. It's numeric. It's just a couple of ratings, so it makes it easy for people to do. Um, the individual assessment is meant to be a little more in depth, obviously, and a little uh, discussed a little more deeply so that you can really try to identify the slackers, the people who aren't doing well, or the people who feel like things are not going well. And I thought that was a nice subset of questions. You could obviously adapt those. Um, <coughs> so what I would say, solving the, solving the problem of team projects, first option, don't do one anymore. Ah, maybe it's too difficult. Um, or maybe you would look at it and decide, I don't know if I really need the team for this. Maybe it would be better to work on individual skills. If maybe there are team skills, there are some things. What I've done is, I started with a team project. I started to say this, that was kind of a typical team project. Um, and I have now whittled it down to sometimes that we just do the part of teams that I think is useful, which is to bounce ideas around about experiments and give each other feedback. And then after that, we just break up and everybody does all the other parts themselves. They collect data because I realized, you know what, I want them all to collect data. I don't want one team member to go collect all the data and everybody else to type the numbers in, which is how they think I go, oh, just let's assign roles. I'll be the typist. And that, that seems reasonable to them, but if you just say assign roles, maybe they could be forgiven for not really understanding what the roles are or alternatively mercenary decisions deciding to be the typist. So 
So I decided in that case, well, I want you all to do it. I might as well just assign you all to do it then. What's the point in calling it a group project if it's really not a group effort thing anymore? Um, so I whittled down a group project to where it's now not really a group project anymore. <laughs> it's a group discussion of, of, of experiment ideas, and then it's an individual project. So I actually settled for a lot of my decisions on, I'm just not going to do a group project anymore. But I think there is value to them. I think there's a lot to be said for students learning those skills, like how to negotiate, how to plan, and how to do uh, time management and things like that. Um, and so uh, these are other suggestions for what we do. And I took these off the TLS website. A lot of these have links to them for ways that you can do this. Think about the process itself, not just the product. Because really, if the product is the important part, I would say you're really talking about an individual project. To be fair to people, they should produce in individual products themselves. If it's a group product, that's different. If you really care about a group product, but I think oftentimes we care that the individuals do the final uh, parts of the work. Um, think about what the steps should be and then build those in. Absolutely require them. I would say my mantra to myself is if it's not required, it's not getting done. Nobody does the optional stuff. Or the people who do are the A plus students. <laughs> that's not who the optional stuff was for. It's where the students who are doing so poorly. So I go, that's not optional anymore to plan ahead. I want you to plan ahead. It's not optional anymore to stop in the middle and reflect on how it's going, give some feedback, and then move forward having identified problems. Um, I will say on the idea idea of assessment, I've always done team assessments. Some, well, sometimes I've done really heavy ones where I ask the teams every two weeks to give assessment of how they're doing and how the other students are doing. There are years where I get fine, 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 and then the week the assignments do, they go, so-and-so never came to a meeting. I can't believe they didn't do their work. They said they were going to do it. I ended up doing the whole thing. I'm like, fine, 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 not fine. So. I would say you can probably assess too much. Uh, sometimes they haven't done the work yet and everything's fine. Or they're not willing to complain yet. The, real, the true assessment, I think, comes at the end. That's where I got the honest assessment of how people had done. If you don't do interim assessments, at the bare minimum, do an end assessment to get see how the functioning of the team went. Part of that is making it clear that this is part of the goal of the assignment, is to learn how to work on teams. It's not just do it and I hope yours works out well, which is what the real world is like. It's do it and let's see if you can do it better. Let's see if you can reflect on it. Let's see if we can. It's fair to have, I make jokes about this, but there are there is going to be a slacker in the group. How do you cope with it? It's not impossible. It's not a mystery. Once you've done it once, you go, oh, that's how we do it. Let's bring it up in the group. Let's make it an open thing. Let's get that person out of the group if we can to get that person to work in the group. There's all kinds of solutions for it, but you've got to do them the first time to find out about them. So thinking yourself about where do I hit the hang-ups and what could I build in uh, as part of the process, I think, is a smart way to do it. Um, same, establishing ground rules. This is part of just explaining to students, what's the purpose of this? What do I hope you're going to get from it? What should you do you know, as we're going along? Uh, not just the steps, maybe, but how to problem solve. Um, so including conflict resolution skills and strategies. I don't try to teach this stuff. I just go, if you're having one, let's try to work it out because that's what life is like. You have everybody works at different speeds, but maybe you can all agree that at some point you will have all done your work and you won't micromanage each other. I don't know what the solutions will be. I mean, often I find it was a good question. What do they come to ask you for? Just pointing this out to them does a lot. I don't find that they all come, I would worry sometimes maybe they'll all come clamoring in with questions about how to fix this stuff. Mm, no, not really. They don't mostly want to talk about it. Just giving them a little bit of insight or asking them to reflect a little bit goes a little ways. Um, I don't find that they're all storming forward to, oh my god, there's information about this? Come tell me. Um, but, uh, but, the, but the parts you give them and require, they do. Um, thinking about what the pitfalls are and thinking about how to put in some of those metacognitive skills. If you think planning is critical to the project, forcing them to plan. If you go, you know what, it's a term paper, you can't write it the last night, then force them to turn in parts of it early. Um, before the last night, if you don't want them to write it the last night. If it's due all in one day, uh, I write stuff the day before it's due as well, and they, they might be expected to. Some of that adjustment has been me realizing what the real world is like and what you can accomplish in these classes and what you can't, and deciding that I should try to accomplish the things I care about, and I should just leave the rest of it out. So when I decide I care about these things, I try to build them in now to the assignments and to the process itself so that it's not... Uh, I'm not just hoping <laughs> students will do these things. I'm actually requiring that they try it. Some number of times they're not going to help. That's not going to help, but uh, 
I, I'm hoping, I guess, I'm hoping that it does. So my main suggestion, use those ideas uh, of metacognition to think about your own pitfalls or aggravation. I was trying to think of a positive way to put that to the things you want to improve in your class. I don't have a positive way to put that. The aggravations that you always have with teaching, I think, can be fixed in part by thinking about how you set about, set your goals um, and what you hope to do. Uh, figure out what you mean to teach and teach only that, assess only that. I would suggest there's a lot of great materials for doing those kinds of things. Assessment can be a pain in the neck when it serves your purposes because it's asking about the things you actually hope students are making progress on. It can be a great value, um, but it's hard to do and it's hard to kind of retrofit some of this stuff into your classes. Sometimes I find that as I read about these ideas and strategies, I toss out old stuff that I do and just bring in some new ideas because some of my old ideas were terrible. Um, but mostly, and, and then the second point I would say, try to build things in that you care about and actually require them. I found that to be a successful technique for getting students to do what I want, and I have not been successful in any other way in getting students to do what I want. Just talking to them about what a good idea is is not usually sufficient. And that's true for all of us. I had this on a previous slide and didn't even say it, but in order to train, change strategies, it, the new strategy has to be a lot better. It can't just be a little bit better. We don't change strategies if the new strategy is just a little better, because there's a a big cost to changing strategies. So when students are successful, they tend to kind of do what we do. They just keep doing the same thing over and over again. When they're unsuccessful, a lot of students will go, oh, I need a new strategy, and they'll change, and they'll adapt, and they're doing great. Some students go, oh my god, I don't have any more strategies. I don't know what else to do. I don't even know how to think about this. How did I get a 10 on the exam? I thought I was going to get an F. I didn't think I was going to get a 10. Um, and so giving them some of these skills and strategies, building in the things you care about, talking about them openly. I think we're talking about insight, sometimes just talking about for your assignments. What are the multiple, what are the different goals that you have for the assignment? What are you hoping students will get out of it? Um, if it goes wrong, how will they know it has gone wrong? I think those kinds of information are really useful to students, even when the assignment does go wrong for them or they're the least motivated person in the class. At least they have a sense of what the point is uh, of doing it or what they're losing by not doing it, potentially. Um, and I uh, uh, name check a couple other websites that I go to a lot. University of Minnesota Carnegie Mellon also has a good website. You're linked to that. You have some links to that, I think, on the TLS website. That's most of what I have. What kinds of things do you want to talk about? People have other things they want to think about. Yeah, well, oh, oh, yeah, so <laughs> I don't use the exact same exam. Yeah, um, that's true. <laughs> I got to say, I've worried about that at other universities. I have learned not to here. I don't think students are sharing exams here. <laughs> <laughs> I would expect exam grades to in <laughs> continuously increase if were the case. <laughs> they don't. Um, and I mean, I do, I, I change my questions around, but I write the same kind of exam. I mean, it's a research methods class. The information's not changing year to year. So there's just sort of an enormous number of things I can ask about. But the exam's very consistent, I would say. I, I use questions that are at about the same level, I cover the same topics, and I always split my exams between multiple choice and some amount of writing, and I say to them, I don't care about the writing itself, it's not the formatting and grammar now, it's just the content. Um, and so I grade, what I find often with my exams is that there are students who, there are first of all students who do this really poor estimation. Those are the ones who often do come talk to me. They go, I studied for this exam. I don't know what happened. I thought I was going to do well, and I did badly. Um, but uh, the, oh, what was I going to say? When I'm designing the exam. Oh, oh, but then there are also students, and I usually say this at the wrap up of when I give back the grades, there are students who did great on the multiple choice and bombed the essays and vice versa. Those are meant to assess the same stuff. It's all the same content. So I go, that's a problem. If you you feel like you have this, if the assessment, this is an assessment of your knowledge. If you feel like you have the knowledge, but you 
get a 10% on one section and a 90% on the other, something has gone wrong. And again, the implication is it's not me, it's you. You have to figure out how to take these exams. I'm writing an assessment that, as far as I know, is pretty reliable, but it wasn't, I mean, it may well still be reliable. This may be a reflection of the class I have this year. Um, but it's but but I'm trying to get them to focus on what has what has happened, even to treat that as a problem. And I will have the students who do come talk to me often say things like, "Yeah, I'm really bad at multiple choice." I'm like, well, now's the time to try to get better at that because multiple choice is a feature of your life for four or five years when you're in college. Um, so. Uh, is that what you mean? Or well, am I worried about people sharing exams? I'm gonna say, I just threw my hands up. I, they don't seem to share exams. I don't know why. Are they not smart enough? Are they not wily enough? I don't know. Um. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It is, it is informative that way, actually. Going through the exam, we have to admit, I don't do this all the time, but going through the exam and noticing, like, oh, did people perpetually miss a question? Yeah. When it's on me, I put it on me. I had a bad question on my midterm this time. I was like, oh, you know what? Half the people answered B and half answered D, and I get it. It was a stupid, it was not well stated. And so I said, I'm tossing it. I'll take both answers. I don't care. It was, the, it was a poorly stated question. So we just went over it, and I said that was a bad way to ask it. Yeah, I would say if, if all the students get something wrong, that's. Oh. oh God, like, so, well, yeah, so if I had, so I would, I guess I would pay attention to, I do try to check whether everybody's getting all the same questions wrong. Um, uh, because that would indicate a bad question. The ones that everybody gets right, and I don't know. Yeah, I mean, potentially. What I, what I always, I've never presented the same exam two years in a row. Even when questions are similar, I flip around the answers so that they're not the same answers. You have to still, if you've memorized it, you still have to memorize all the parts of it. You gotta remember all the correct things and I change the examples and all. Um, but but it, uh, the, oh, what were we talking about? The, uh, how to design it, oh, year after year, yeah. Well, I guess I was just thinking, so the, the, even, the, so, so I make it fairly consistent, but yeah, I mean, I guess what I'm looking for is, um, if I see patterns, I mostly don't. What I mostly find is, oh, people miss this one, they miss that one. When it is, when it's these sort of idiosyncratic mistakes, it, it's often not about the difficulty of the question. Um, and I tell them ahead of time, I write complicated questions, of, you know, if it says not, I put it in bold, but pay attention, circle it. Do you not notice the not? It's a, circle it for yourself then, if you don't know. If you're the type of person who misses the not or the accept in the question, there's an easy solution to that. Some of these are mechanical. And I would say, you know, I hear myself and I go, good students already do this. They already notice all this stuff. Well, I get some students in and I go, I go, do you, it's a multiple choice exam, do you X out the wrong answers? Do you know that two of them are wrong, like off the top, you're positive they're wrong on any, almost any multiple choice test? A couple of the questions are just gonna be wrong and you know they're wrong. X them out and stop reading them. <laughs> they go, oh, interesting idea. <laughs> Once I know it's wrong, I can stop looking at it and I'll just pay attention to the ones that are right. Now there's a lot less information. But honestly, I go through this process with some people and they go, oh, oh, oh. I go, read it backwards. Read the answer. Does it beg the question? Is it absolutely the only possible way to, does it fit the question? They go, oh, I never tried that before. And I go, you know when you're confused, start there. Circle the questions you don't, you're not positive you know the, the right answer on. Because most people aren't getting tens on my exam. Even when they do poorly, they're getting 50%. Well, these are the ones I have in my office hours. This is the ones where they've come to me with the exam. They go, oh, I don't know what I did. I don't know what's happening. Or I'm the first person who ever said, if you have a problem, why don't you come talk to me about it? And they come talk about it. Um, but I often get confusion. And I will say where I started thinking about this was, or what I've been thinking in general is, the value to doing this metacognitive talk, self-awareness building, even if you yourself use it and describe it to the students, how you planned it, what your goals were, it gets them thinking about what this learning that's taking place and it pulls some of the mystery out of it. When I look at the distance between good students and the poor students, a lot of them, what they don't differ on is they go, I don't know, I just do it. 
I just do it the way I've always done it. I don't really know how I do it. A lot of good writers I get don't know how they do it well. And some of those are kids are going to hit a wall at some point because now then they're going to be given tasks that are a lot harder or they're new or they're unmotivating. They don't care about them and they're not going to be able to do it. So sometimes when I'm doing some of these tasks that I think, well, it's kind of remedial for some of my students given where they are, I go, this is good practice for you to have strategies for when you don't know what to do, for when it's not intuitive how to just organize these thoughts. Or maybe you can organize a 10 page paper, but now you have to write a 100 page paper and you got to think of it in a different way. Let's get some strategies for breaking down tasks you don't know and you don't care about or you don't know of. Um, and so I think that when you start thinking that way and talking that way, students start to pull that in as well. They automatically start doing a little more reflection, start trying to pull some of the mystery out of it. I would say that's good for the good students as well. It's good for us good teachers as well because it's not good to just rely on, ah, I just always do it. It doesn't solve all the problems. Problems. It's been interesting to all of a sudden have a, I was feeling pretty confident about my midterm exam wrapper and collecting some data on this and now I have a data point that doesn't fit. It's interesting. Um, and so that'll allow me to learn a little more <laughs> about what I've been doing and why it's not as consistent as I thought it would be. Um, but so I, I mean, it's, it's easier for me to say because I teach psychology. This is a topic, it's a reasonable topic in any of my classes, but I would use it anyway because I, I think it's an interesting way to think about teaching. I think it's good for the students to think about learning as well as trying to do it. Um, in development, there's a famous study, one of my favorite ones <laughs> where very, do we have time for this? Are we out of time? The, I'm sorry, if you have to go, you can go. I'll just tell one quick story. So the study is, is a developmental study on learning, and they did it with uh, five-year-olds and eight-year-olds. Now, typically, any developmental study you do on cognition, the little kids do worse than the older kids. So it was like a memory task. There were a whole bunch of cards spread out on a, a table, and they were all upside down, and you had to turn one over at a time and try to uh, memorize them. Well. Kids were told a strategy at the beginning. They were told some of these cards have sports equipment on it. Just remember the sports equipment cards, okay? And then so they would turn over each card in turn, okay? Told that they were have to remember the sports equipment at the end. Both groups of kids are told the same thing. Also mixed in on the cards are fruit cards. So there's fruit, there's sports equipment, there's other random stuff. So they go through all the cards. They go, okay, here comes the memory test. Find the cards with fruit on it. So the eight-year-olds go, oh, oh! <laughs> The five-year-olds start flipping over the cards with fruits on them. The five-year-olds went into it. They ignored your strategy. Forget what you said to do. They just tried to memorize the whole entire table full of cards. And so they do better. You go find the fruit, they go, no problem. Fruit was over here, fruit was over here. They do really poorly on both but they do equally badly on the fruit and the sports equipment because they didn't have a strategy. They were just trying to do it as they could. I see the students sometimes coming into class and they're like, oh, they're like, I made, they bring in their cue card. Who taught these students to make cue cards? They've made cue cards for hours. I'm like, you should have spent those hours doing something else that would have been more informative than cue cards. Um, but I think sometimes, you know, we have old strategies. When they work, why change? And we don't for the most part. Even we experts don't change when we have a strategy that works. It's when it doesn't work that some students go, oh, I can't do this stuff. And we don't want them to say, I can't do this stuff. We want them to try to find some new strategies, reflect a little thing. Um, so I find it helpful to build those things into my classes. Solve some of my aggravations, maybe solve some of their aggravations. Other thoughts and questions? I, I bet they write that. I bet they write that on the final evaluation. They don't raise their hands and go, can we stop working so much? <laughs> Actually, some of my students do. The ones who are really familiar with me go, can we just skip today? Um, but no, not, not, no, not often. I mean, I do, it doesn't, it doesn't hit everybody as useful, um, I think. And like I said, I think some of the good students already do all this stuff. And so they go, yeah, obviously. Obviously, I read all your comments on my paper. 
you know, obviously I know what to fix to make it better. Um, but other students, really, the whole thing is a mystery, and I think they giving them little bits of it helps. Um, but yeah, no, I, not not so much. But I'm sure there are people thinking that stuff. Boy, what a lot of work. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I don't, I gotta say, when I talk to people about frustrations with teaching, that one is, it, 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 it ends up being a big category of, I wish they would take responsibility for their own learning. Um, my personal approach, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a person that everybody whines to. So I sit and listen and I go, oh, that's hard, your car, oh, that's such a bummer. But the paper, right? The paper still do, even though your car broke down. <laughs> so, and, and when, it, I mean, when it's ridiculous, I go, it's not fair to everybody else that they, a lot of those guys stayed up and crammed and were really stressed out, believe me. They got the paper in, but they were stressed and, uh, sweating and you're telling me you couldn't stay up and sweat that night you had to go to bed <laughs> well, okay but it's gonna cost you what I what I find when students are really upset I do try to flip it and go we got I mean there's sort of the fairness and rules and you know what at the end of the day they go okay I get it it's not really fair for me to just get a bunch of extra stuff that people that other people didn't get but they're not thinking about fairness they're thinking about how sad they are so I try to give them a little sympathy for the sadness and I go we got fairness over on the other side though and fairness just resolves the uh, I guess the question of whether everybody gets a whole bunch extra and I, I don't know I'm pretty flexible about some stuff so um, it could be harder but I think too you know a little bit of self-awareness what do you care about and um, I mean I know people who and I hear complaints from students I'm a program director for undergraduates I, we have professors who go no late papers I don't care don't turn it in I'm not reading it and they go ah what am I gonna do he won't accept late papers I'm like don't turn in the paper late what do you mean what do you do turn something in I, you, we all get to make our own rules. You can moan about them, but at some level, if it's a rule and it's stated to you as a rule, you can't, as the student, you don't get to go, I don't like it. You can go, I think it's crappy, I don't like it, I don't think it's fair. But at the end of the day, it was the rule, and, and I, my general advice to people is, those are the rules, what are you saying? You ought not to have rules. So um, I find with a little bit of sympathy, you go, yeah, but fairness over here and reality, they can distinguish between the two. Doesn't always work, and I listen to a lot of whining, like I said. So, <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks for coming.